much for inviting us to this beautiful city. I brought you a small picture of our hometown, which is medieval hometown situated on the valley of the, the mine. Um, great team here in Armenia. And I have two topics this morning to cover in the remainder of the time. We are now in the state, in the setting of ALL and a very high risk ALL and transplant for high LL. So we're looking at only five or 10% of the population that need transplantation. And now comes the question, if after all that treatment, meaning if after stem cell transplantation, you do see a relapse, is this the end of the road for the children or can we actually do something about it? And my talk has two points. First point is, can we prevent relapse after allotransplant? And the second one, if it does happen, is there anything we can do about it? Now, as to the first point, can you prevent relapse after stem cell transplantation? And this is like a ride with a mountain bike on the, on the mountains. You need to know your terrain. And I want to point out, in the 2015, if you had relapse after stem cell transplantation, your prognosis was very poor. This is a study by uh, Dr. Kulen, and she summarized the data in 242 children all over Europe, and the event-free survival, if you had a, a, a relapse after stem cell transplant for ALL, it would be in the order of 15%. So the prognosis at that time was really very poor. So what can you do about it? And if you think about it, think about stem cell transplant as a watch, a Swiss watchmaker, and he has different parts. There are different stages in a transplant, and if you look at the various parts, like a watchmaker, and look at them very carefully, you can identify certain points that will help to maybe prevent a relapse in a particular patient. So what are those, uh, what are those little clocks? One is MRD pre-transplant, one is the type of conditioning regimen, one was potentially stem cell source, and another one, very important one, is monitoring transplant. So, long time ago, the group by Peter Bader in Europe, they, they analyzed MRD pre-transplant and identified MRD pre-transplant in ALL at least, not necessarily in AML, but in ALL, as one of the important markers. See, if you, if you have low MRD, um, the cutoff was here by PCR in the order of 10 to the minus 4. If you have low MRD pre-transplant, your transplant is going to go good. You will not have a relapse. However, if you have high MRD, you're likely to have relapse afterwards. So that's been known for quite some time. And then there was a European study uh, guided by Chris Peters in Vienna. And the group looked at the type of conditioning regimen. And the easy question was, we all want to get rid of of total body irradiation as part of the conditioning regimen. So um, if you omit TBI and replace it by chemotherapy, is the result in ALL equally good? And the expectation has been it should be because we wanted to get rid of radiotherapy. But to the surprise of many, um, if you give TBI based, it's TBI etoposide versus all other chemotherapy regimens, TBI-based do much better than chemotherapy-based. So this was a big disappointment. But even the follow-up data, which I will not show today, they still hold the trend. So TBI is a condition regimen, at least at this point in time, seems to be necessary to cure children with ALL. Now, is there anything about stem cell source? And the major question at that time was, is a matched sibling donor equal to a matched unrelated donor? And matched unrelated donor um, is by European standards, 10 out of 10 HLA matched or nine out of 10 HLA matched by HLA high resolution typing. And I'm just going to give you the curves. So sibling donors and matched unrelated donors are doing equally well uh, with very, High, with very specific defined um, therapies in terms of supportive therapy, in terms of follow-up. So the curve for much unrelated donor in Europe has dramatically increased over time, and it's equally good than a sibling donor. Um, can you prevent relapse after stem cell transplantation if you monitor for MRD? There was a recent um, paper coming out by Peter Bader in collaboration of Europe, North America, and Australia, 
where they looked at MRD pre-transplant and MRD post-transplant, and they asked the question, which of the two is the most important? And it turned out that MRD post-transplant is more important than MRD pre-transplant. So if you look carefully at MRD post-transplant, meaning at day 30, 60, and 100, and if you become negative, then your chances of surviving are really excellent. However, if you continue to remain MRD low or positive, then chances of relapse are relatively high. So, basic message, yes, there are certain things we can look at in order to make our results better. Now comes the second part. What if, despite of all those measures, we do experience relapse after transplant? And those of us who are in the field and who have done transplants and who realize how difficult it is for a child and for parents when leukemia comes back after transplant, it's too much of a disappointment. So can you treat transplant after stem cell transplantation? And I want to briefly introduce you to four approaches, metronomic chemotherapy, stage, um, because we're going to focus on the specifics now for uh, post-transplant uh, post care. So the aim of all these approaches is to achieve a second remission or a third remission, and then probably go on to another hematopoietic stem cell transplant, and for CAR T cells, that question is still open, but for all the others, it's relatively clear that once you achieve another remission, you should go on to another transplant. So Metronomic chemotherapy as plus DLI has been introduced by many people, and I just point out the results from the Frankfurt group. So I apologize for this small table, but the principle is um, you apply metronomic low-dose chemotherapy in the setting after transplant, and uh, these are 101 transplants for ALL, 23 relapses, and they got metronomic chemotherapy, they got intrathecal chemotherapy, and some donor lymphocyte infusions, and the overall survival was 39%. So it's still not good, but it's much better than the historical 15%. So that's one approach that you can use. Um, and the most important thing is not to use too much chemotherapy, because um, people are very sensitive, or children are very sensitive after ALL. What's new on the horizon? maybe some molecular inhibitors like BCL2 inhibitors, but there are no data out there yet. Blinatumumab has already been mentioned. It's a bispecific T-cell engager, um, activating the T-cell, recognizing the tumor cell, killing the tumor cell, and I'm a little proud because it's been invented in my hometown in Würzburg by our adult group, and then passed on to Amgen, and then become internationally available. And the most important thing was the the design of this linker between the CD3 part and the CD19 part. Now, the, the latest data was showing that with that, um, you can have, in the Rialto expanded study, you can have a really very, very good overall survival of 87%. Now comes the bad, but it's better if you transplant later on. If you don't transplant, the curve drops. So, uh, I'll scoop this. Inotuzumab has already been mentioned. Um, it's directed against CD22. It has a linker and it has a little backpack. That's what I tell the students. And this gets internalized so the cells get destroyed. There are two initial studies out. Both say quite good survival in the adults. In the New England Journal, that was 80%. But as already been pointed out, veno-occlusive disease or sinusoidal obstruction syndrome in the following transplant is really a major problem. So distance to transplant is important and also not to use two alkylating agents for the subsequent transplant. So I'll skip this. Um, now I come to the last point. This is, I think, the most important point that we have in terms of CAR T cells. Um, uh, as already been pointed out, CAR T cells are cells that get a an additional second receptor, which is specific for the antigen that you want to target. In our group, it's Dr. Caruana, who was in Houston and Rome, who joined the group. And he has performed one, uh, together with Franco Locatelli, has performed the neuroblastoma trial in Italy. And uh, this needs clean room, it needs a lot of infrastructure. 
and I've brought you some, I hope it works, um, we'll see, yes. Here you see the CAR T cell, and here you see the target, and you see how the CAR T cell is really eating up this uh, leukemic cell and then passing on to its second target. So this is really fascinating, and I've brought you one of our patients where you see leukemic relapse, multiple relapses, here shown on PET scan, here this one and this one, and after only one bag of CAR T cell infusion, it disappeared and the patient is MRD negative. So this is really amazing. Um, now we have, and these are the last slides that I'm going to show, what are the real world data with CD19 CAR T cells, and these are the German data just recently published. So these are all high risk leukemia patients, either multiple relapses or relapse after transplant. So with the current CD19 CAR, we're not good as the Chinese data with a dual CAR infusion we're at 43% survival, and why is this? Because you have enormous rate of relapse. It's both CD19 negative and CD19 positive relapses, and the mortality is around, one is around 5% in this real-world data. And the most important thing, the message this morning is, if you give CARs for relapse after stem cell transplantation, if the relapse occurs later than six months, your curve is quite good, you're around 60%. If you have an early relapse within the first six months after transplant, it's still not good. So here, a lot of work still needs to be done. I'll skip this uh, for the sake of time. Can you treat relapse after transplant? Thank God, yes, you can. And this is certainly an area where we should have clinical studies and we should go forward because our patients deserve it. I want to summarize chances for cure with metronomic therapy and DLI. Yes, you can start with this, and this is easy to use. This is easy to perform. We have increasing chances with novel immunotherapeutic approaches. We have to carefully consider the intensity. This is for CAR T cells before apheresis because you want to collect enough CAR T cells. And then you have to, once you have your CAR T cells, if you use frozen ones, the time frame is about four to six weeks with the commercial products. If you have a clinical trial, at least with the, with the Miltony trial in Germany, you have 14 days and you inject, inject them fresh. If you carefully consider intensity of bridging before lymphodepleting chemotherapy, don't kill the patient with too much chemotherapy. You have to just keep him alive, you have to just keep him stable, you have to keep him without infections, and he will do very well. Best chances with CAR T cells are with ALL relapse if it happens after six months, after stem cell transplantations, and novel constructs are on the horizon, like dual infusions or dual CAR T cells or some other constructs. And with this, I want to thank you for your attention.